But we'll head off to the next panel session for today. I'm joined here in the studio by uh, Jörn Wittmann. He's Senior Director of Public Policy and Legislative Strategy at Volkswagen. And Dr. Christian Jack, she's Compliance and Legal Lead at Cariat. And also with us are Corinna Schulze. She is Director EU Government Relations, Global Corporate Affairs at SAP. Hi, Corinna. And uh, Dr. Andrea Simandi, she's Senior Privacy Attorney at Microsoft. It's so great that you're taking the time and are joining us today. And uh, with you four, I would like to uh, discuss how innovation, privacy and data regulation can yeah, can function a bit better together, let's, let's say it uh, that way, so how to find the right balance. And um, we, we've been talking about the regulatory framework uh, earlier today as well, um, but to, to kind of give you a better overview of what is already in, in the market um, regulation-wise, uh, Christian, you have agreed to yeah. kind of do the heavy lifting uh, for our panel today at the beginning and give us an overview about the regulatory landscape. So we're kind of on the same page uh, to discuss how we can tackle the issues. Yeah, okay. So um, thank you for invitation and uh, I will make a short uh, presentation of the few acts that we have to deal with and we will talk about today and um, I think the, fair, the first one and the, the most famous one of this is the so-called Digital Service Act regulation. It's uh, an uh, amendment and also a change of the, of the old e-privacy directive and uh, I want to focus on the, on the data protection related questions but in, in, at, at first I want to say what is the main content of this uh, regulation. Uh, it contains the, the framework for the uh, uh, exemption from liability for uh, intermediate services that already have been uh, part of the e-commerce directive. And the change now is, is that it implements uh, specific obligations to specific providers of intermediate services, like we already uh, knew in, in Germany with the so-called Netzdurchsetzungsgesetz. For example, a notice and action mechanism for illegal content. Um, internal compliant handling system um, and special rules, for example, for advertising purposes and uh, recommender systems, transparency rules, and, and, and therefore also uh, data protection relevant topics when you uh, are based with uh, profiling of sensitive data or profiling of data with minors in, in connections with, with advertisement and, 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 and this. Uh, uh, so it should not be uh, allowed anymore for, uh, uh, to, to, to show advertisement uh, on the basis of, of, of profiles uh, with sensitive data or with data of, of minors. Um, the, the, the second one is the so-called Digital Markets Act regulation. Um, it contains new rules for so-called core platforms. And these core platforms have to be identified as so-called gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers have a specific uh, a power on the European single market. And so there is a new approach uh, with the State Digital Markets Act regulation to, to, to shift from an uh, ex post antitrust intervention to uh, ex ante regulation with this Digital Markets Act. And uh, what's the data protection perspective? Um, it contains special rules for, uh, for, for, for the data usage of, these, of such gatekeepers who have many data. And it contains also access rights for end users as well as uh, business users um, that uh, they, they can get uh, uh, access to, to specific data on, on, uh, that the, the platforms and these gatekeepers are processing. Um, the third one is the so-called uh, Data Governance Act regulation. Uh, the Data Governance Act regulation contains uh, many topics. I want only to, to show one topic that is uh, quite interesting. It's the, uh, the topic of the so-called data uh, intermediation services. Um, these, these data intermediation services uh, uh, should become in the, in, the, in the point of view of the, of the uh, Data Governance Act, a very important role in, in European data business. And it contains uh, notification duties and uh, conditions uh, for providing uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the business of uh, data intermediation services and also contains uh, spe specific rules for 
data handling of when, when you are such a data intermediation service. And uh, when you have a look on the, on the website of the European Commission, um, there are three examples for, for such data intermediation services. They, they, they mentioned the so-called data intelligence hub of Deutsche Telekom. They mentioned the, the French company Davex uh, uh, as global data marketplace. And they mentioned the so, uh, RP Argo as agricultural data sharing hub as examples what, what would they understand uh, under this new regulation as uh, data intermediation services. Um, the, the, the fourth one, and I think it's um, for, for us from the data, prospect, uh, data protection perspective, the, the most important one uh, beside the AI Act regulation, it's, it's the Data Act regulation. And the Data Act regulation um, contains rules um, to make data available for, for users of connected products, uh, making av data available for data holders to data recipients upon user request. Um, making data available from data holders to public sector entities, um, rules for switching between uh, data processing services. It's an approach that, that had started with this uh, SWIPO initiative a long time ago. Um, uh, additional safeguards against unlawful third party access. We already have in the GDPR such a rule. Additionally, it's now implemented in the Data Act Regulation 2. And we have uh, uh, rules for development of interoperability standards for data to be accessed and transferred and used. So uh, many topics. And the most important topics, of course, is this uh, making data available to users of connected products and uh, making data available from data holders to data recipients uh, or upon a user request. Um, the fifth one uh, that I want to introduce uh, for, the, for the discussion is the AI regulation. The, the goal of the AI Act regulation is to harmonize rules for European single market for the development, the placement on the market, uh, and the use of AI systems in the Union. And you have uh, rules for prohibited AI systems that the uh, European lawmaker does not want to have in the European Union. And then you have specific rules for AI systems that uh, create uh, a high risk to the... the, the, the fundamental rights of, of, of European citizens. And for this, there are special rules to, to specific uh, actors. So you have obligations to, uh, for, for providers of such high-risk AI systems. You have obligations uh, for product manufacturers. You have obligations to importers. You have obligations to distributors. You have obligations to, uh, to the users of such uh, high-risk uh, AI systems and the connections with the GDPR is, for example, the topic with the data protection impact assessment and also with the topic of automated individual decision making in Article 22 GDPR. Um, and the last one uh, is the so-called NIS 2 directive. It's uh, an amendment of the NIS 1 directive and it has also the, the aim to strengthen the, the IT security and cyber security in the European uh, Union. And the first part is that member states have to adopt uh, national cyber security strategies. And um, it's uh, an, a new approach that um, private enterprises that are specifically mentioned in, in NIST 2 from, from the sectoral perspective um, have to implement cyber security risk management measures and reporting of, 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 of threats and incidents. And there you have special rules how, how, how to deal with this. And uh, the connection with TGPR is the Article uh, 32, especially with the security of processing and the, 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 the data breach notification rules of the GDPR in Article uh, 33 and 34. Because also in, in NIST 2, you have notification duties for, um, for, for incidents and both uh, have to, uh, to, to be put in place to different authorities. And that's also a topic that uh, NIS2 uh, covers. So many regulations, um, many law text for interpretation, uh, a lot of things to do for people like us. <laughs> Uh, it, it sure sounds like it. So we, we do have the regulations that are already in place, right? Of course, the GDPR, the Data Act is 
yeah, it's nearly here. Uh, we're all looking at the AI Act, of course, but there are um, other regulations. I, I think it's especially important that you mentioned the NIST too, mm -hmm. uh, because I think a lot of people uh, overlook that the security regulations more and more address uh, data security issues that, of course, then connect uh, back to the GDPR. So, seeing that this is the environment we all have to work in, uh, maybe Corinna, let, let's start with you, um, how do you tackle all the different regulatory requirements that are already in place and that are soon to be uh, there to be compliant with as well? Thank you, Rebecca. I hope you can hear me all right. It's perfect. Thank you. you. Very well. And thank you for the presentation. I think that was a brilliant overview about, um, you know, understanding um, the tsunami that came our way. <laughs> and that we are um, currently um, all trying to get our um, our head around um, how to, to comply with all of that. So I think um, from our perspective, first of all, um, we usually have been following um, the legislative process and we are, we are you know, if you, if you will, we are, we are part of it. So we are obviously aware um, what is what is co coming our way. And in my role um, as, as government affairs, I'm obviously in constant exchange um, on the different files with uh, colleagues on the ground from the different business units. So, you know, we are already, um, while the process is going on, trying to prepare and, and, and understand um, and sort of, um, yeah, as, as early on as possible, analyze um, what's, what's in the different legal texts and um, anticipate as well. Sometimes it's difficult, like I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk uh, more about the AI Act where a lot of things are up in the air, but um, we're obviously trying to anticipate as, as, as good as we can what's, what's um, coming our way. And so we are um, in touch with the different parts of the business where we think they are uh, mostly concerned. So obviously for the GDPR, that was our data protection office, um, but also, you know, the different lines of businesses that we think are, are mostly concerned. Um, for the AI Act, that that would be certainly also our um, cloud services in the HR um, space, and so we um, we communicate what we believe will be in the law, and then we already look at what are the processes that are to be um, set up, um, how we can streamline it. But um, as we could see from um, uh, from the presentation, what is also extremely important is that everybody talks to each other. Um, because otherwise, if we were working in silos, um, that is that is obviously uh, a huge problem. So um, while we are looking at compliance and the, the, the provisions as such, um, we are also trying to connect <laughs> the different uh, responsible units and the different lines of business to make sure that um, everybody understands um, what is required from a, from a compliance perspective. But it's a huge task, huh? so that's that's for sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karina and um, and Andrea. What, how do you handle it? Uh, did you develop, I don't know, uh, specific strategies to, to cover all the regulation? Um, is it like the same mechanism that uh, Karina just described to involve, of course, all, all the department and all the the product development uh, processes? How how do you tackle the regulation? Well, what, what how did you call it, Karina, the the tsunami? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's. That's fair to say, and, and I'd, I'd echo what Karina was saying. I mean, at Microsoft, we have experience with this, of course, over the years, as we were just preparing up to the GDPR, just to say an example, many years ago. But I think it's fair to acknowledge that the internal coordination is needed more than ever before. We have a very robust regulatory governance framework that really involves all stakeholders, which we have further enhanced in this in this sort of light of upcoming regulations. And that is really to design to navigate all the different requirements coming out from Europe, but also globally. And, and while we are sort of operating globally scalable services. So I think it's, it's really important to acknowledge the increasing complexity and challenging nature, not only to us, to companies and service providers like us, but really European companies in general. And Björn, Christian, can or do, do you agree? Is it is it somewhat different if if you're a, a manufacturing company that has like 
businesses set up around the globe but it's of course a, a german based uh, company and for you like mm. you're you're more focusing of course on, on the software side of things is it different is it the same are there specific issues because all of your cars are, are it's basically hardware combined with software so mm -hmm. it's covered by a lot of regulation as well <clears throat> I cannot say if it's necessarily different because I can underline what the colleagues before already said. But of course, when you have to manufacture a product and especially a product that needs to be safe, um, you know, um, and needs to be on the market and make sure that um, everyone is secure that's using it, um, I think you have longer development cycles. Mm -hmm. And when you have a long development cycles, it's much harder to change uh, how it is designed afterwards or during the process. And that's something, of course, we, we struggle with as a company that's, that's um, manufacturing cars. And um, other than that, I would like to underpin what the colleagues were saying. I think it's, it's really hard to identify a starting point for what Karina said is this tsunami. You have to somehow find out what are implementable measures, really implementable measures that you can put into this product at the end of the day. And yes, that requires working together with all the departments, but it's also a different way how, how other departments think. So mm -hmm. it's one thing to reach out to them, but to work with the answer and give them an answer that they can really work with, it's, it's a huge struggle. So I think sometimes from a regulatory perspective, the regulator thinks, okay, it's just another thing that you already do more or less, but every time it touches a different department of what just Corinna said, this gets significantly and exponentially um, more complex so that would be that would be my my take on that mm, okay so maybe the regulator kind of uh, doesn't see how, how many regulations are already in place and what what requirements uh, you already have to be compliant with okay uh, Christian mm. um, yeah but, um, from my point of view we have the, the following uh, additional complexity that um, for example uh, a group like like Volkswagen um, has different brands and you have to interpret all these these legal texts that are new in 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 uh, in, uh, in 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 the in this in this area of of, of, a, of a large group, and to to find uh, the 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 one single opinion how how to, to to do it and how to to bring the the the, the solution then into the software to, uh, uh, products. Yeah. I think, if I may, I think that's a really good point because at the end of the day, um, you're only efficient in such a large company if you can rely on, on things other parts of the company have already mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And if the interpretation can vary that much like it does under GDPR, but also as it will under the Data Act, um, there is no, at the end, the responsibility and the liability is with the single brands. So how can we make sure that they accept what was already, what was already uh, maybe tested by a different company and not and analyzed and assessed another time, uh, 12 times fold uh, mm -hmm. in such a corporation. Yeah, okay, oh, okay, I, I, I see <laughs> I see the issue. Um, I'm just wondering because we, we, we do have the EU election next year, so it's kind of a good moment to reflect on what is happening right now. And as you describe it, it's, it's kind of a lot already. So how should regulation maybe work in the future? What could we propose to Brussels, to the EU institutions to make it easier, but also more coherent and build a more harmonized framework? I would love to, to get your, your ideas. Um, Andrea, let's start with you and then we'll circle back. But sure, yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start and, and say something potentially obvious. I think we should let the dust settle a little bit, really, because really the, the current commission has finalized several landmark legislation that will determine how the digital sector is governed for so many years. And um, I think under the new commission mandate, the focus really should be to work out the details for enforcement of these new rules and really provide further clarity for businesses on how to abide by these new rules. Um, I think the clarity about the ground rules is just so important. And for example, uh, we at Microsoft obviously recognize that we'll be regulated by, by many of these pieces. We also serve our customers and I'm supporting the um, enterprise business and work with customers all the time who look at us and ask for help, like, okay, how do you navigate the complexity? So why I think the EU has really had a role as a global leader in, in regulation and the number of countries have followed the EU, but there are some other areas where there is no harmonization. I think really we should, we should now 
let the dust settle a little bit and and understand the practical requirements and implications. Okay, so first wish, let the dust settle a little bit, give us time to implement the regulation that is already like proposed uh, is uh, is in, in the market, is up and running. Um, Jan, your wishes, please, to my, the EU. My, my wishes. <laughs> yeah, so I would say focus. So I think no one involved here has an issue when regulation comes up that that tackles the market failure and is aiming for protecting fundamental rights on the market. That's not an issue. But I have the, the tiny, tiny feeling inside of me that there might be also sometimes other motivation to regulate. So maybe, for example, to tackle geopolitical issues that came up or maybe um, political um, or regulatory failures of the past with another regulation on the top. Uh, which in a way always has to be written in an abstract way that creates more legal certainty, uh, legal uncertainties. And I think that's, that's an issue. So I would really recommend focus on protecting the fundamental rights. Don't go beyond that. I have no good example in my mind where that ever really worked out well to tackle um, geopolitical issues. Maybe here's someone with me in this round who can teach me something better. But I think this would be, if I had a wish, that would be the one focus on the fundamental right protection. Mm -hmm. And maybe even a bit more, I don't know, a, a, a principle-based approach, right? Not, not so descriptive regulation that kind of binds you to this teeny tiny list that you like, need to fulfill all the requirements, uh, but focus on like maybe high risk uh, areas, principle-based approach. Mm. Okay, so focus. Um, Corinna. How would you like the, the next EU Commission to, to act in the digital regulatory sphere? Yeah, thank you. Obviously, I agree with everything with, that was said. I like the uh, let the dust settle very much. So we, um, uh, we totally agree to that. I would even say a little bit, go back to the roots, because what we missed, um, especially under this Commission, was the quality. Mm -hmm. And under under all the rules that came up, um, before you had a proper impact assessment, you had clear definitions, you had clear provisions. But right now, what we see is that often, you know, um, especially from a legal security perspective, the definitions are all over the place. Often, in one and the same piece of legislation, you um, you're confronted with different definitions for the same scenario or the same, you know provider or, um, um, you know, you name it. So we would really uh, like to see if we're not just focusing on settle the, uh, let the dust settle, but, uh, you know, there will be um, more uh, legislation, which I think we can expect, then at least, you know, uh, make sure that quality is uh, put over speed and we go back to having proper impact assessments, understanding the impact, having clear um, definitions, legal security, and you mentioned that already, um, Rebecca, uh, um, technologically neutral. So um, principles based and not, you know, try to regulate a technology, but uh, rather, you know, the, the, the harm that, that can be done. And that's something that Jörn said, said as well, clearly. We would hope for that. Let's see if we get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we are uh, like, we're compiling our, our wish list, so everything is allowed. Christian? Yeah, I, I think uh, there is an additional topic that uh, is the, 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 the question of what, what I want to achieve with, with new law. And in the domestic or national area, I, I, in my personal opinion, I observe that the, the lawmaker only, or in the, in the normal cases, um, makes new laws to solve problems that, that already have come up. And when I read the, the, the introduction texts of, of all the regulations the European uh, Union um, brought out, and also when I read the, 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 the old regulations and directives from the end of 1990s, where, 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 where also a digitalization packet came with the old data protection directive, with the e-commerce directive, with the telecom legal framework, with uh, signature, uh, 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 laws and so on. Um, there, there is always the idea that with new law we create new business. 
Mm. That is what I read in this text. So the, the idea that, that the business is not developing from itself, it's, it is developed because we are making a new legal framework. And the, this idea is probably true, but it, the, the, the problem is when you have too many open legal questions, it is not uh, going forward. It's more than everyone has to read and to understand and, and, and it, it's, it, the, the progress is then lower. Mm. And so it's also an probably ideology approach to say, um, do I want to create new business with law or do I want to let the business uh, create itself and then as a lawmaker I solve problems that come up because of you know, uh, changes that, that happen and that are not good for the society. Mm. I think that is also a very um, interesting uh, aspect because I, I, I think you're absolutely right, if, uh, especially if there are too many legal insecurities or uncertainties, companies are getting more afraid instead of mm. being more innovative because they're always afraid of the sanctions because all the regulations are combined with heavy, heavy sanctions. I mean, the AI Act sanctions are even higher than the GDPR, mm. so I mean, wow. Um, I. I wouldn't dare to develop something if I'm not sure I'm allowed to, you know. So I, I think that's an excellent point as well. Um, let's see what the Commission has to say about that. We'll, <laughs> we'll transport what, what uh, your, your wishes are and uh, absolutely hoping for a better regulatory framework uh, for, for the next legislation in, in Brussels. Um, to, to get a bit more specific, I would like to get your views on uh, two regulations in, in particular. So the, the data and the AI, because they're obviously the most broad in scope. I mean, they're basically totally horizontal, covering uh, all of you, but also uh, a lot of other companies uh, in, in the European market and beyond. So. Um, Jan, maybe we'll, we'll start with you this time. Uh, do you have like a specific perspective on, on the Data Act and the AI Act? And what would you recommend other companies do to, to get the compliance structures running? Because we're now half a decade into GDPR uh, and companies are still struggling. I mean, that's what we're seeing right now. And uh, but I, I, I bet that you've all learned a lot as well, how to tackle such a, a complex um, legislation and maybe you can share some mm. of those like learnings. So yeah. yeah, yeah. so when it comes to the Data Act, so my personal opinion is um, that the idea of making data movable, like porting it, taking it out, putting it in, in a different system, um, that is not too bad. And that's something, of course, uh, that, that should, be, should be a standard, to, to, at least to a certain extent. I think the here again, and that's I think fits to what we said before. The, the Commission or the Parliament went a bit too far and tried to regulate much more than that. Um, I think that was a, a decent wish. That that is okay. But everything that moves now into this territory of interoperability makes things highly complex. Um, and also, if you always have to think about how to make data interoperable with other services, even with live services, from how I read the Data Act, mm -hmm. um, that uh, hinders you from design designing a new function, an innovative function for the customers and for the market, um, because you always have to think of what can others do with that data and the obligations are on the, on the company that, that produces that kind of technology. I think that's, that's something we struggle with. And in the end, uh, you also here you multiply complexities because the relationship of the Data Act with the GDPR, um, they just equal, so to say, and now we have to find a way. Do we decide? to go more in the direction of GDPR and only make available what, what we think um, can be made available under GDPR? Or do we more see it on the side of every data should in general be movable and should be interoperable and so forth? Um, and I think, I mean, I think if we, with these terms, with the dust and the tsunami, I would say we, we really stuck there kind of between a rock and a hard place, mm. to be honest, because both foresee uh, strong sanctions we, and it's really hard to interpret that. Mm. Okay, Christian, uh, do you uh, are you already trying to to develop like compliance strategies and and systems for those upcoming regulations? Um, yeah, what what's quite hard to 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 bring together in all these um, reg regulations and um, especially now from the topic data act regulation, um, you have in each of these acts specific roles and these roles um, then they have to fulfill specific obligations but these roles are not really they do not fit together so for example you have in the gdpr the role of the controller 
who is responsible for the whole data processing and you have the data processor who, who has a, um, a different responsibility because he acts on the behalf on the controller and then you have the data subject and uh, in the data act you have a different different roles like the data holder uh, the data user and the data recipients and the f one example the data user in the data act is not this or, or does not have to be the same like the data mm -hmm. subject and when these roles uh, are not fit together you have then to to deal with the gdpr how to solve it and and that's not so so, so easy and and for uh, i will bring in uh, uh, um, because it was quite uh, famous in, in germany the last years this implementation of the of the old e-privacy directive in in german ttdsg and uh, they 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 uh, um, brought in this, this terminal equipment protection and there they used again a new, a new legal term from the telecommunication law, the so-called end user. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the European e-privacy directive uh, 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 deals with the, with the roles of subscriber and, and, and user in, in its own definition. And now with Data Act, connected cars and so on, you have all these legal terms, these roles with specific responsibilities and you have to bring them together and mm. and and you have to make a solution that 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 works out also for for all, for everybody and and that's uh yeah quite quite heavy to 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 bring this all together mm. absolutely especially because i can imagine that the legislators didn't really have all the like devices and end user devices mm. in mind when they were drafting a lot of this regulation and now you're kind of stuck with okay we do have all those cars that are basically all devices and all, all are used by the end user mm -hmm. uh so yeah okay uh so that that but that kind of kind of comes or brings us back to the question how legislation should be developed and mm -hmm. definitely uh should keep all those different um categories uh obviously in mind and at the minimum provide harmonized definitions for for everything mm -hmm. um andrea uh, could you share your views maybe especially on on the ai act i guess um how how do you how do you perceive the the legislation is it like is it a good approach are you already uh building up your strategies to to tackle all the requirements thank you and and what you said rebecca the I mean, I'd like to make a few points on this one. And you said harmonization. I think that's such a key element and so important. I mean, let's not forget that not only the EU is regulating. And I mean, I, I mean, the first point I like to make is really to have an eye towards harmonization, especially in the AI context to the G7 Hiroshima pro process. There is a need for global harmonization. And, and the second point I make is I think a few years ago we used to say that oh it would be terrific to adopt future proof regulations i think now with this immense innovation and the speed at which technology evolves it's probably hard to say that that the regulation can be future proof but i think it would be wonderful to have at least future aware regulation that allows enough space for for innovation, really, and then really, I mean, making sure that the vast potential of AI can be realized, obviously, in a completely responsible way, respectful, respectful of human fundamental rights. And Microsoft has been working with these uh, AI principles for many, many years. Um, and, and I think that one is key. And then thirdly, I'll just mention that I think and I'm, I'm an attorney working with enterprise customers, as I mentioned, the contractual frameworks are also evolving. So it's also good to keep that in mind. And just a, one small example is, um, is that, for example, we have uh, the new copilot uh, co copyright commitments, which extends defense obligations to cover the output content of commercial copyright ser copilot services. I think that's super important because when we're doing risk assessments, uh, we'll have to look at it as a whole. And these will be very important factors um, in all of them. That uh, kind of connects uh, this this topic to the, the question I would uh, or I wanted to pose next. But Corinna, maybe we can bind it kind of together. So do you have uh, 
like perspectives you'd like to share on, on the data and uh, on the AI, of course, but also because you, you all of obviously are working globally, are there developments that, that you at SAP see and, and other regions of the world where regulation is done differently or is it is it the same issues around the globe or maybe maybe you have some views on on that as well okay thank you very briefly on the um the data act we've we've said a lot already and and we agree to that and we have the same position what was very important for us was that it was clarified and christian um explained also the differentiation between data controller and data processor that uh, under the data act we were not forced to hand out our customers data I mean, this was um, this would have been all but unacceptable and totally in infringement with the, the GDPR. So we were quite glad that this was clarified. Um, but it's it's already quite something that we had to clarify it. I have to say in that the spirit of the GDPR wasn't taken into account um, in the beginning um, for for the Data Act. Um, so so much on that one. Um, to um, to your next question, Rebecca. Um, do we, how do we see the development of AI legislation around the, the globe, maybe also compared to the um, AI Act? Um, I, would, I would say that um, I, th I think the AI Act will remain for quite a while the only strict and sort of very focused piece of legislation. Uh, around the globe, what we see in other geographies or countries is clearly that, um, like taking the example of Australia, um, they are looking at what existing legislation do they have in place, how can they cover um, this already, how can they um, protect fundamental rights via the existing legislation. They also have uh, quite a comprehensive data protection legislation in place. And obviously also in the area of cybersecurity and consumer protection. So uh, many fields which are already um, also touching and covering and regulating. Same goes for Japan. I would, I mean, the US, we know it, there is not going to be any legislation soon. Canada takes a similar approach. Um, so I think that um, for the, the other geographies, they will go a bit or take a bit of a lighter touch than what we see here in the EU. And as Andrea mentioned already, they are very much looking at the G7 Hiroshima process, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. Now on the, A, um, the AI Act itself, um, we hope that we can stick to the risk-based approach that was um, put on the table in the beginning. We are a bit worried about um, regulating the technology, regulating heavily foundation models or uh, GPAI. We really would hope that for the final text we can see a focus on um, the applications and uh, what could really impact uh, safety, security and, and, and fundamental rights. Um, and having said that, um, also like Microsoft, we also have already a lot of ethical principles uh, in place and guidelines um, to really look already now at scenarios and cases where we would say, uh, no, this is this is too risky and there might be too much harm. Um, so these processes are already in place for us as well, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Corinna, for yeah, shedding some, some light on, on this as well. Maybe to, to wrap it wrap it up one last uh, question to you uh, Jörn um, because in in the EU space we are seeing that the GDPR also is being kind of developed further there is the enforcement review uh, going on and uh, of course especially in Germany for those of you who don't know we do have 18 data protection authorities great um, what are your wishes for the future, seeing that the EU is kind of trying to, to mm. make, a, make the enforcement uh, better, faster, streamline it and harmonize a bit more? Yes, so my wish would be give us tools, give the industry tools to handle the legal uncertainties better so that we can still innovate but in a more secure environment. So in GDPR we see tools like, like codes of conduct and certification, that's one thing. But I think we need to, to go to, to a, a more holistic view on that, that not only the industry comes up with an idea and then still operates for a while with these legal uncertainties and has to bear all the liabilities that, comes with, that come with it. So um, my idea would be think of solutions that, that make it possible to handle that with, with sandbox 
sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes, where we can say, okay, companies who want to do the right thing, you can try it here. We evaluate together on a more on the broader scale than just maybe the relationship of the industry together with the authorities, maybe with more stakeholders involved, or maybe on, on fundamental questions. I think Bitcom had a had a pretty nice idea in. Um, in one of the um, latest statements, which was like maybe a council that is a is, is more multi-stakeholder approach for the very urgent and pressing topics under GDPR. For example, AI and other topics where the whole society take, is, has the, the possibility to make a take on it and uh, go into the interpretation of the guidelines. So we just, if you continue regulating on that scale and with that level of detail, give us some space where we can innovate. That mm. would be my wish. I think that's a nice like last uh, phrase, last word for, for this panel discussion. Uh, dear audience, please uh, join me in thanking Andrea, Corinna, Jörn and Christian for um, yeah, sharing their views and also their, their tips and wishes for, yeah, for tackling this regulatory tsunami as it has been called. Um, yeah, it was great, uh, great to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. And dear audience, you have a couple of minutes of a break now, so you can get a fresh cup of coffee. And then we'll split the stages, so you can either stay here with me and um, join me in hearing about the data protection and cybersecurity developments in China. I think that will be most interesting. Or join my dear colleague, Charlene uh, Roloff, in our uh, ground floor stage for digital sovereignty and data protection. See you at one, and have a nice break.